Okay, Jim. Okay, Jim. I'm getting ready for a game. I got a big bad. He needs to be terrifying. And I, yeah. I've, I've got some ideas for like how to how to portray him. You ready? Like uh, yeah, he's, he's just going to be threatening the party with, I'll get you. I'll get you with everything I've got. Ooh, no, fear no, me. No, no, no. That is that is no. terrible. That is terrible. Your players will okay. laugh at you well, Jim, if you bring I'm, that to the table. Yeah, I know. Okay, well then, I need your help here. I need to know how to role okay. play this monster in combat, okay? Hey, you're in luck. That's what we're talking about here today on WebDM. This week's episode is sponsored by Hero Forge, the masters of customizable miniatures. If you've never played with their online character creator, man, you're missing out. They've got so many options, including color printing. You can make your character exactly the way you want it, and they come out looking great. Are you making monsters? They've got some brand new options for insectoids and multiple arms for all your combat needs. If you've got a 3D printer, you can download the STLs and print it yourself, or they can cast them and send them straight to your door. Go to HeroForge.com and start building your minis now. Link in the comments and description. Okay, Jim. So we're talking about role-playing monsters in combat yep. because, you know... You can give all the evil speeches you want, but you still got to be able to do that while while attacking and rolling the dice, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, you sure do. You sure do. I would um, say it's my biggest problem <laughs> is to continue role playing <laughs> once my brain goes into the mechanics. So yeah, this would yeah. be a good learning for all of us. Right. Right. So like, I feel like there's a lot to to chew on uh, when you're talking about role playing and combat from a DM's side, right? Like this is very much from a dungeon master's perspective as they are, you know, running a monster or an NPC in combat, considering how they can role play that out through description and tactics. Like, is there something that you can say about this particular enemy? through description of how they fight through the actual decisions you make during combat and 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 have it be um you know have it be something that has weight and impact on the game mostly so that you are able to like make them unique make them memorable but also so that you can answer questions like how did that enemy know that i was a caster you know, how did they know that I was going to heal this person? Uh, mm -hmm. Right. Like to just be able to answer those kinds of questions. And it also is useful for like avoiding weird out of character behaviors, especially with beasts. Right. Like I find that a lot of times the way that animals are portrayed in an RPG is just like, this is not how I understand animals to act at all. Uh, and for me, it throws yeah. me out of the game, you know? Well, you know, there's a lot of animals. Unless it's mating season or they're injured, they're not just going to attack you outright. Right. <laughs> Most of the time, Things they like might that. just run away. <laughs> they might just run away, yeah. So, you know, when I think about how I role-play and portray uh, something about the world through my enemies, through the NPCs and monsters that the players fight, like, I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm reinforcing the lore of the setting here that I am making mm -hmm. a statement about the game world. And while it might go unnoticed by the players, which a lot of things that a dungeon master does will go unnoticed, it's there for the players who are paying attention, who who note the details and the changes and enriches their experience of the game uh, as well as like, you know, providing you with another means to make statements about your game world and what it's like, you know, and, and especially as you think moving beyond monologues and taunts and things like that, which is usually where this advice stops role playing and combat for a DM, um, because it is much more <laughs> than just monologues and taunts. Oh, most definitely. But it is a good place to start because like I said, one of, one of my big problems, um, I'll do this all the time. Yeah. I'll write out like don't forget to monologue about this. Like uh -huh. the 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 couple of bits of information that as the fight goes on they try to use to distract the players, right? Uh yeah. you know, just screaming out the name Martha or whatever, <laughs> like <laughs> to try to throw your opponent off. And I'll forget to do it. Like I'll like I'll have yeah. those written down and then I'll go through the whole combat and they kill the guy or whatever, he runs away and I'm like 
shit, I didn't mean, I didn't give them the clue that they needed to get to the next part because I never, I didn't monologue. So sure, sure. How, how, Jim, how did you, cause you are a prodigious monologuer, uh, in, in, in both sure. real life and in your, uh, NPC portrayal. How did, how yeah, do you, I got a lot uh, talking do to me. How do I do it? So <laughs> boy, like to talk. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, I do it extemporaneously for the most part. I, um, you know, I get to know my, my NPCs and, and if they're a monologuer, if they're a taunter or a talker, then I just draw upon what I know about them, uh, as a character and, and sort of their relationship to the events. So to me, a good monologue, a good taunt is very much about the characters. Right. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to monologue about my villain's plans. I'm not going to monologue about things that are unrelated or background or anything like that. I'm going to monologue about how pissed off my NPC is at the players or how just mm -hmm. incredulous, just I can't believe this is happening. You know, how, how in the world did this, you know, you, you were nobody's two weeks ago and now you're 15th level, you know, things like that, <laughs> you know. Uh, because I, I, I check out when a villain monologues and I'm a player, you know, I, I, I check out if it's anything more than just a, a, a sentence of, of growled, uh, you know, combat commands and then a snarl as they leap into combat. And so if I'm going to do it, I wanted to, I want to engage the players as much as possible. And what do players love more than anything else? It's to be told how awesome their characters are and to mm -hmm. revel in their characters' exploits. I don't say this with cynicism or, or, or you know, malice. I think it's that's why I like playing as well. And so, like, being able to do that from an in-character perspective, like, lets the players see the impact of their actions on the setting gives you a chance to sort of like portray your your uh, enemy for a minute and is a nice setup for a combat and maybe it gets them or gets your players pausing long enough so that one of them doesn't just go well, i attack while he's in the middle of talking you know um which is also why i don't usually monologue in person I monologue through telepathy magic mouth spells illusions uh things like that you know text messages yeah, un underlings <laughs> Under yeah yeah each one of them has Tagged a snippet of a <laughs> yeah yeah things written on walls of the dungeon as they're coming in yeah anything like that because once the parties meet they're going to want to throw down you know it's just going to happen mm -hmm. um so one last thing here while we're still talking about sort of dialogue and combat um i found online a, a really neat resource called the creepy combat commentary um and this is from telecanter's receding rules a D, D blog we'll post a link to it and it's like 16 prompts for ways that you can taunt or comment on the combat from a monster's perspective some of them that are my favorites are the apologizer the monster that is apologetic and uh, sorry for what's happening um the threat maker someone who's just going to you know wow, this is the revenge i'll get if you kill me uh kind of thing mm -hmm. um and there's one that even reads as kind of like a meta commentator which is one that i've done for enemies where it makes sense for instance uh had a death slot who would comment from a metagame level on uh you know what was going on in combat i'm like oh 37 damage that's a lot of damage you know or man gosh that you must be below bloodied now huh <laughs> like you know <laughs> as a way of portraying an alien mind that might see reality a little bit differently um mm -hmm. but yeah we'll, we'll post the link to that because i found it really handy uh for like mid-combat taunts uh and the like because otherwise i'm like you pruitt my brain's in combat mode i'm not thinking of anything other than yeah. keeping track of this whole uh, whole thing most definitely and uh one thing i love about you jim is all of the crazy uh blogs that you read and all the, the insane links that you provide uh which you can get more of that if you come on over to patreon and check out our podcast where uh we're, we're throwing links out almost every every one so uh check that out um so uh to refocus and re uh reform our uh, our conversation here it's time to yeah. get into the the tactics 
tactical yeah. paradigms, how they move yeah. about, what what's going on with these enemies. Um, so let's uh, let's let's jump right into that, Jim. With, let's roll some initiative on this. Um, where where do you start when it when you're thinking about you know you've got you got the location, you got your enemies, like how are they gonna how are they gonna move um, yeah. about this place? Yeah. How are they going to move about this place? Taking it to the next level in terms of portraying your enemies uh, or the PC's enemies, uh, you know. I think the, the 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 good place to start, really good place to start, rather, <clears throat> is in monster roles, right? Fourth edition mm -hmm. introduced this, uh, you know, these terms of like classifying monsters as a brute or a skirmisher or a sniper or, you know, controller type monsters. And I've seen other schemes online which go even more in depth than that. And I found it a bit much uh, for me. And so I tend to think of them in terms of their military history <laughs> classifications, because mm -hmm. of course I would. Um, oh. And so I tend to think of monster roles in terms of lighter heavy cavalry, lighter heavy infantry, and then support. Uh, which would include artillery, right? So heavy cavalry hits hard. It, it, it's tough, but unsupported, it's going to get swamped and, and taken out, right? This would be your classic big brutish monster that needs to keep moving because if it stands still, the players are going to just swamp it through the action economy. And there's light cavalry, which hit hard and move fast, but if they stay in any one place for more than a round or two, are going to get squashed. And it's similar with infantry, right? Like heavy infantry are, they, they take and hold ground, right? They're tough, they're mm -hmm. durable. They might not be the strongest or the hardest hitting, but they're reliable. And then light infantry is sort of everything else, skirmishers and snipers and stalkers and things like that. They probably hit hard. Um, and even if they don't, they're not enemies that you want to like ignore for very long, even if their individual attacks aren't very um, you know powerful. And then support is like, any monsters or NPCs that are there primarily like a support casting role or ones that provide like combat debuffs and the, the like. I prefer to like debuff the players or to lay down like area control type effects than to buff the monsters because it's something that's more interactive for the players, right? Like, mm -hmm. do they really care if this monster has this magic buff on them or this, you know, enemy NPC has, you know, they drank this potion and this is what they have. Like, I could just give that to the monsters without the justification of it being magic. But if I use, say, a spell slot to cast an area of effect spell that's going to deny a certain, uh, you know, portion of the map from the players, like, that's more interactive from their side. So that's usually what I'll uh, go with and support. Um, and from these monster roles, I put them into kind of these tactical paradigms that uh, I'll use for, you know, when I have uh, monsters. For the most part, they work pretty much just for humanoids, but certain monsters uh, fit into this as well, especially the intelligent ones. Uh, and those paradigms are the mob. This is where I take just a big group of monsters, undifferentiated by type and, and role, yeah. and they're just a big blob, <laughs> you know, just a big mass of them, and they fight the PCs you know, in whatever way that they, the PCs come at them, you know, they're poorly disciplined. They don't show any tactical acumen or, or knowledge. It's just like human wave, uh, attack, right. Um, you know, appropriate for low hit die, small humanoids, uh, everywhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. next would be warband. Uh, Warband is, uh, you know, they display a bit more tactical uh, sense. You know, they'll stick together. They're not going to go out of their way to, like, make stupid decisions or something like that. They try to act like one cohesive unit, but it's very much around their boss, whoever their leader is. Without their leader, mm -hmm. they tend to, to degenerate into a mob. Um, and even with their leader present, there's still some elements of that Warband that are going to try to show off. To, you know, to, to make a name for themselves and be seen to be mm -hmm. heroic and individual. Um, so, you know, the bulk of them might stick together and support each other, but you might have uh, enemies out there who are just like, no, I'm going to take on this one PC. Like, we're just going to go one-to-one, toe-to-toe kind of thing. Um, moving up from there is the Phalanx. Uh, and this is a well-disciplined and tactically coordinated enemy. They support each other. They use mixed arms, you know, uh, light infantry supports heavy infantry. So you'll have big bruiser type monsters mixed with ranged support and the like. Uh, 
fast hitting monsters with support to give them the cover mobility that they need a mix of all three really so that you have fast uh you know heavy hitters and harassing type enemies and you know enemies that are very much going to be a pain to take out these tend to be reserved for like the big set piece type battles where you got a lot of time to dig in and have this combat um mm -hmm. and then following on from those I have sort of like a hunter's type paradigm where the idea here is that the enemy fights the players from a distance. Like they don't want to get caught in melee. So they'll use a lot of disabling or debilitating attacks, attacks that hinder or slow them down. Um, it's more harassment than anything. But then it kind of mm -hmm. moves into a stalkerish uh, type monster when they use those tactics to seek out lone PCs and disable them or kill them, uh, you know, by themselves. These are sort of more stalking predator types. Um, and uh, finally, there are times when I play a group of monsters as if they were PCs and pull out every dirty trick I can think of to win. Yeah. I treat this as a battle I'm winning, you know, basically. Oh, yeah, yeah, the murder hobo, the elite <laughs> SWAT team that, yes. uh, <laughs> that yep. knows everything. Yep, send them the uh, dogs, set everything on fire, you know, bribe their bribe their allies, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> and scorch the earth. The right, yeah, real combat is war types. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. Um, yeah. Well, okay, so that but that's a nice that's a nice wide array of 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 types. I, I love the first three, and it's basically like how much leadership and military training do you have with the mob, yep. the warband, and the phalanx? Um, yeah. Uh, because depending on on the on the style like i can totally see like hobgoblins you got a group of hobgoblins that's going to be like a phalanx like this is what yeah. they do like, what their they do. lives yeah. are war uh whereas you know you can have an orc war band or a mob of goblins mm -hmm. moblins uh, as moblins called. yep um, certainly and uh but but the the more the stalker type uh enemies you know to me uh, it, this could be any number of very powerful like solo monsters yeah. that are intelligent and just like you know whether it is they 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 subside on fear or it's just this is how they do it and this is how they have to do it um the idea of that that hunter stalker mentality for for enemies is is always to me that's the one that uh, when i'm a pc i'm like i i those are the ones that don't like i don't like it when i'm like <laughs> wait a minute you feel like somebody's watching you and you look around yeah. and there's nothing it's like ah oh, crap you know yeah these are yeah. uh like the drow uh, I think the drow would be a type like, of those. Yeah. The, the way they, yeah. yeah, the way they fight, it's just, it's not fair. Like, sure, it, yeah, you're on their home turf. They're they're they are using tactics that play to their strengths and your weaknesses. They're mm -hmm. attacking outside of your range of vision. They're using debilitating uh, magic and and uh, weapons to pick you apart and for fates worse than death. Uh, it's mm -hmm. it's a it, it's a good way to highlight them. This is why I say it works best for sort of the humanoids of, of D and D or, or fantasy RPGs. Um, and it does require you to kind of think of your monsters in in terms of these two axes: what role they have uh, and and sort of their mm -hmm. roles in in coordination with each other. Um, there's obviously terrain that comes into this, whether they're on their home turf, whether they're not, things like that. Um, yeah, I was gonna bring I was gonna bring up uh, Jim, uh, kind of a to butt into one of our other shows on the adventure location. If this is their <laughs> layer, you know, if yeah. this is their home base, you have a whole other level. I mean, we're talking like Tucker's Cobalt's levels of, you know, they have traps and drops and fire shoots and every every conceivable machination that yeah. a group of little murderers can think of to keep people out of their domain. Like right. it depends on how just how crazy do you want to go with this, you know? But yeah, keeping yeah. it within the, the bounds that you've given yourself. Right, because right, the, the whole point of all of this is to portray your monsters with a degree of, of difference from each other so that the players mm -hmm. can go, oh, yeah, it makes a difference whether we're fighting hobgoblins or orcs or drow. Like, like those combats are fundamentally different as opposed to just the minis get thrown out, the tokens are put on the map, whatever, and, and, and you know, you just kind of go from there. It's easy to do that as a DM because you've got so much else going on, right? Mm -hmm. And this is why I lay these things out ahead of time and sort of categorize these monsters and groupings of monsters ahead of time so that I can just fall back and go, okay, what is this? Okay, well, this is an infantry mob, right? Or this is a, a, a mixed unit phalanx, 
and and mm -hmm. from there it's very easy for me to um, um, to you know to think of how I'm going to portray them, but it extends to like outside of combat as well, the immediate combat, right? I ran a group of gnolls, um, like a whole war band of them, uh, like 90 something <laughs> across an extended encounter that took place over two sessions where the idea was that they were trying to herd the PCs into a specific location using fire and the terrain. And then once they were in that location to spring a trap on them again, using more fire, but this time, uh, they attracted a bunch of zombies and ghouls who were, uh, attracted to a bunch of corpses that the gnolls had laid out in the middle of a field. And so the idea is that the party would be surrounded by fire and smoke while this group of ghouls and the like, um, you know, descended upon them and that most of this took place at ranges well beyond what normal D&D &D takes place. Like ranges where spell sniper uh, or a, a sharpshooter would really matter, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. And uh, But it was in the dark with, again, the smoke. Um, so it wasn't quite a combat encounter. But it wasn't... It, it wasn't a, a safe place for the players to be. It, it was confusing. You know, the way I uh, described it was very, you know, deliberately sort of like, you don't quite know what's going on. You thought it was one fire. Now it's behind you kind of thing. And so to me, that said something about those gnolls. They used fire. They used other creatures. They, they did everything they could to avoid coming to grips with the enemy directly. You know, mm -hmm. even if all that had failed, they would just try to pick the party off with bow, you know, with bow and arrow fire. And so that says something as opposed to a null war band that charges in all <laughs> slavering jaws and hopped up on, you know, who and all that good stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, that's uh, why I, I don't know. I, you want to think I, of it sorry. this way. Yeah. Sorry. I, was <laughs> I, say, I, don't, I don't know who, 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 who do you I mean? don't know who, you know, oh. who? I don't know, but, but yes, uh. <laughs> uh, having, having gnolls that are, that are fire starters, uh, those, 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 those are prodigies, um, to go to the opposite end of that as a, as a segue, but um, uh, uh, you mentioned ghouls and zombies, like yeah. now you have to think of the opposite. Like if we're talking about non-intelligent creatures, you know, zombies, uh, the undead. Some a lot of times they have a necromancer or some kind of leader, something, some intelligence directing them. But what right. if they don't? So, like, how do you play things like that that are quote unquote non intelligent? In this, we're going to basically be like, you know, low intelligent, two, three. Uh, sure, sure, like the lower ends of them. Yeah, I. Um, so. <sighs> This is one of those things that I find is a pet peeve of mine when I'm a player uh, mm -hmm. is when like low intelligence Smart, or beast. low. <laughs> yeah, the, the beast is a classic <laughs> one, right? Like just the beast that acts uncharacteristic. Like, what do you mean these wolves just attack us? Right. Like, are they starving? Did we did we blunder into their territory? Like, are they being controlled mm -hmm. by something? And this is my this is usually my perspective as a player, because when I see wolves just attacking my brain doesn't go, oh, they attacking because it's D&D &D and that's what D&D &D wolves do. And this is why they do it in video games and a whole bunch of other stuff, because that's an unsatisfying answer for me. So I try to yeah. assume that like, well, these are wolves that are going to behave like wolves. And anything that deviates from that is a signifier of something else, is a signifier that being controlled by something or that we have have put ourselves in a position for these wolves to want to fight us. Right. And I, I think that that's that's sort of where this style of play can really excel is if you do have players that are coming from that perspective of like these are just animals you know why would they be doing this and that you're also deliberately changing the way this animal would otherwise behave to say something right oh you've stumbled into the territory of the savage druids and like the the animals around here have a taste for man flesh you know, <laughs> and, and are aggressive. They, they don't fear steel. They don't fear fire, that kind of thing. That says something about your world as opposed to just every wolf you come across attacks you because that's what they're supposed to do because it's a game and we fight wolves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's my soapbox. I mean, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, I'm going to, I'm going to scoot you over a little bit because we had, I had somebody recently ask, ask us about this. Like basically like this one person had a, had a, had sentinel feet and they had a, a pole arm because that, that's what they wanted to be. They wanted to protect the casters and they had a, a dumb beast come up 
and then the DM had them move around the the area of reach of the pole arm Oof, to go directly man. after the casters before the casters had cast anything. And to me, I'm like, well, that's bullshit. Like, yeah. why yeah. would they do that? If they're going to yeah. attack, they're going to probably attack the first thing they see because they're not intelligent. They go on instinct, and usually instinct tells you either run away or fight. Not yeah. fight, but stay out of the reach of that person who can stop me because of the feat that they've taken. And, like, that's that's a whole other metagame thing. It's right? a whole other metagame thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there are some enemies where that's appropriate. There are some enemies where that's appropriate and they've never fought or engaged the party before. But not an animal. Come on. Like, I, here's, here's something that I want to point out while we're on this. And then we'll get back to some real talk because I think we're, we're in the weeds of soapbox land to mix metaphors. <laughs> Well, you're going to need I, a soapbox in the weeds. <laughs> right. When I think about undead, and I think about sort of the mindlessness of undead, and 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 sort of like how do they react? Constructs are also another good, uh, you know, good kind of monster for thinking about this. It's like, what's their programming? What what is mm -hmm. what sort of you know pre-programmed behaviors or innate behaviors might they have? To me, the difference between skeletons and zombies is skeletons are a little bit more aware of what's going on, right? Like they're, for whatever reason, they have just a bit more malevolence about them. They might stalk around and go looking for trouble, right? Whereas a zombie is just going to stand there until you make yourself known that you're a thing to attack, right? Whether yeah. that's because they want to eat you or because you're in an area you're not supposed to be. Um, but then it also lets you do fun things with a, a monster that's kind of one level up, like a ghoul, right? Like a ghoul in the middle of a bunch of zombies is an interesting encounter because the ghoul can talk to you. It can taunt you. It's intelligent, right? But it looks like all these other gross, disgusting undead, right? Yeah. And and it's a, I really like that as a low level encounter because, you know, not everybody expects a bunch of corpses to be able to taunt and laugh and mock you as you're... Yeah trying to figure out which one is the one that's spreading some sort of virulent ghoul plague <laughs> yeah no no totally my all barred party would have their first album called the zombies are talking the zombies are talking. <laughs> um but, <laughs> uh, but but yeah to to, to to kind of continue this the the, the non-intelligent creature discussion yeah um being being genuine uh with with how beasts would act but also uh deciding for yourself like because i mean when it comes to undead like certainly you can have a little bit more leeway in how you mm -hmm. play them you could yeah. have the more like Shaun of the dead undead where they kind of as zombies remember uh -huh, a little uh -huh. bit of what they used to do yep. so like that they you know it could have zombies out in the field just just you know culling wheat but they're just you know they look like farmers going through their going through their final motions uh and yeah. like yeah yeah i uh I, I yeah it's also a good way of of stating like where you fall on the are undead evil or are they just tools axis because if you're undead that just are unattended no evil cleric or wizard is bossing them around like if they just stand around doing nothing then that's a good case for these are just animate husks of meat and bone like there's nothing mm -hmm. sinister going on here it's just weird and creepy or yeah a, you know a necromancer raises them has a use for them and is just like see you tomorrow or you know like see you we're done here and now these uh animate undead roam the countryside looking for uh, the, the flesh of the living to slay and devour the like you know that's the kind of world building details you can put in here um, and it helps differentiate one group's skeletons and un undead versus another group's skeletons and undead you know by how their mm -hmm. monsters behave in combat so yeah yeah and uh you know once you've you've taken all you can uh, or the monsters can. There, there has to be a breaking point um, as we approach the halfway point in our show here. It's a good time yeah. to talk about morale. Should you yes, know, like the old song says, "Should you stay or should you go now?" You know, <laughs> if you... should you? Should you? you should stay? You should stay for the rest of the video. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, morale is another great way to portray uh, your monsters and enemies in combat. Right, like when they choose to fight 
how long they choose to fight and what they choose to fight for speak volumes about who they are as entities, as beings, right? Like if the big bad or their lieutenant or something, uh, you know, in your game is like, this is my point of no return, right? Like I will fight to the death here because it, there, you know, the, the, there's no falling back. There's no, uh, there's nowhere else for me to go. Um, that's different than, all right, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not in this to, uh, you know, to lose my life. I'm, I want to see how, you know, how these PCs fare in battle. I want to test their metal or, or see yeah. what they're capable of, you know? And so morale is probably one of the biggest rules that D and D had that no longer really has that's made the biggest impact on play right like mm -hmm. i think that there's a lot to the a lot that goes behind why modern D, D feels so much like a tactical war game and and you know once the initiatives rolled and the battle maps laid out that it it plays very similar to each other uh and, and i think that's morale because without some kind of guideline or, or rubric for determining when your enemies stop fighting it just becomes a fight to the death. Every fight becomes a fight to the death. I was just going to say, you know, like if, if G.I. Joe or, or Marvel has taught us anything, at least the comics, not the, uh, not the movies, uh, they, they have a problem with killing off all their villains. But in the comics, <laughs> the villains always run away. Like they're sure. always like, oh, you won this day, but we'll rule the next day. You know, like yeah. It, yeah. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's how you build up rivalries. As DMs, the, this is the we, but as we as DMs took the monsters and NPCs that we portray as entities of the campaign worlds, then we'd find that, like, yeah, most of them aren't going to fight to the death, you know, that they're, they're, they're just not. And so whether it's like mm -hmm. training or leadership or some kind of magical, you know, spell or buff or something that's affecting them, you know, the stakes of the combat are such that it changes, you know, what they're willing to fight for, how long they're willing to fight. Um, that that all of those sources of morale are worth considering and worth making concrete in the game world so that the players if they want can go wait a minute these creatures might be fighting to the death because we're fighting them on their home turf or we're fighting them because uh you, you know they're fanatically devoted to this one thing and that's that one group of enemies but then the next group of enemies maybe they have a high morale because of training and discipline and experience but it's flexible there will be a point at which it's too costly for them to continue and figuring out where that point is beforehand can be a neat little tactical challenge or strategic challenge rather for the party mm -hmm. but also gives the dm a way to again say something about their campaign say something about the world and the story that they're telling uh, all together at the table i like to think about my tactical paradigms what kind of monsters are these uh, how do they fight um, a war mm -hmm. band gonna test morale when the leader dies you know whereas a mob yeah. the first time one of them goes down we're testing morale you know yeah uh, well, yeah once blood starts being spilled people's ideas can change right. pretty quickly <laughs> right yeah uh you know there's other you know ways to say it like after a certain number of their you know themselves have been killed or after certain objectives have been met they'll test morale you know if if say the banner falls for instance mm -hmm. that might be a, enough prompting for uh, you know to say okay i'm gonna i'm gonna test morale for my monsters and see if they're still willing to fight uh and then afterwards you signif you know you just are very explicit in your signal to the players like they are surrendering they want to surrender or they are about to flee the fight has gone out of them and yeah. and I find that um, you know having triggers for those and a way to to uh, you know utilize an action uh, resolution mechanic is a good way to do that because then it's a little bit of surprise for you. Maybe they stay and fight. Maybe this is their moment where they're like, nope, not mm -hmm. going to back down. Um, and then there's other like special circumstances uh, that you might have. You might never test morale if they're on a home turf or like guarding something important, uh, or might yeah, be like yeah. they might be. Filled with fanatical devotion, that kind of thing. Oh, definitely. Uh, one one thing I like to think about when when thinking about morale is the story from uh, uh, from the world of George R. R. Martin in Westeros, the night that the that the Targaryens lost their dragon power, 
the night that uh-huh. the mob of, of King's Landing like stormed the dragon pits until they killed all their dragons. These dragons like caged and like it took all night and something like 10,000 people died mm-hmm. storming a dragon pit. If you think about the amount of fire and think about how many morale rolls that whole right. mob, because this was a <laughs> mob of peasants with pitchforks and just whatever implements uh-huh. killing like writable dragons and like th- that like that boggles my mind of what would have had sure. like the, the 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 level of just anger and hate about what had happened to their home turf king's uh-huh. landing um yeah. but that's that's one for me that i always think about when it comes to morale and like what does it take to break and it's like well <laughs> watching ten thousand people get burned to death isn't enough that's how that's a lot of hate <laughs> You know, <laughs> that is so assuming you've checked for morale, the fight's still going on. Um, now it comes down to what, like, how do your, how do your enemies, how do your bad guys fight? How, like, what, what, like, who do they attack first? Do they, you know, yeah. this is, this is the classic going after the casters before they even reveal themselves as casters kind of thing, you know? So yeah. what, what, what do you think of when it comes to, I believe the common parlance is the, how do you, how do they pull aggro? No. <laughs> right target target priority or who who draws aggro yeah i um i usually think in terms of what my combat objectives are um what the enemies know about the party and then you know go from there in terms of it so for me i like to run combats where the objective isn't just annihilation there's something else take yeah. or hold ground uh you know protect or acquire an asset those kinds of things um and then from there look and see like okay given what i know about my monsters and given what i know about why they're fighting how is that going to inform what their opening moves are right Mm -hmm. and and further mixed into this are things like the role of intelligence for them because at a certain point at a certain degree of intelligence it's perfectly feasible to go yeah my 25 intelligence enemy knows exactly what y'all's classes are right like just from the look of you Right, that it doesn't take that long because they're intelligence 25, right? Which which is yeah. hyper intelligent, you know. Uh, it's Sherlock Holmes. Like, yeah, he looks right. at you and knows how you use your weapons and all the gear on you. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like they've got like five Sherlock Holmes stuffed in their brains and can process all this information way faster than your characters can. Good luck. And I think that's one mm-hmm. way to portray like the intelligence of a foe you know you really can rise above your own human (laughs) intellect to portray a fantastic creature that has you know this level of hyper intelligence or meta intelligence whatever you want to call it by cheating and being explicit about it yeah they know this because of this intelligence right because this is Mm -hmm. the level that they're playing on i'm going to give myself these advantages you know this is just a part of their makeup as an npc yeah um but even going below that to more like mortal ranges of intelligence um you know like what do these particular creatures or monsters know about spell casting about healing about the different Mm -hmm. types of 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 martial fighting that are there you know that are available can they tell that that guy that's like raging and covered in bear tattoos is probably really tough versus some of the other members of the party and why they might not want to tangle with them first you know, they'd rather go after one of the squishies, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's a way to do it right, and that is to ground it in the game world. And and if you're mm-hmm. approaching it from a meta perspective of like, well, we're playing this tactical war game, I'm going to target the, the non-constitution proficiency having characters with these types of spells because I know that they don't have constitution saving throw proficiency, then that's like, there's some groups that like to play that way, but... I, I don't care for it. I like to play with the, they know to do that because they're a lich, you know, <laughs> right? Like they know to do, mm-hmm. to, to target you with these kinds of spells because they're experienced. They know what they're doing. They've seen you do this before, whatever, you know, back to sort of like priority in, in combat and, and who you choose, uh, you know, to, to bring your powers and attacks to bear against is like, you know you could do the i'm going to attack the closest enemy that's my default if i don't know anything else this enemy is going to attack the closest Mm -hmm. enemy that it can see you know it could be one that's like one that looks like the biggest threat 
uh, or something like that, or, or, you know, ones that hit them last or hurt them the, the last, something like that. And all of this is like, are they intelligent? What kind of monster are they? What do they know about the PCs? You know, it, it, it's just one of those styles of play that I've run it so long that managing all those uh, rubrics and sort of like frameworks for how to make these decisions comes sort of second nature. Um, but I find it very satisfying for me as a DM because I'm just like, every fight's different because I've got different monsters. Oh, oh, definitely. Uh, but you, it, when, when, when all is said and done, though, if you're in a round and three of the party members hit the monster and one party member hit them for a lot, I usually am like that one, you know, that the one. wizard in the back who hit me with the big ass spell that really now my arm is burning versus the two mm-hmm. sword cuts that are right on me. Yeah, no, that wizard's <laughs> going to get it somehow. I'll pick up one of yeah. the other guys and throw them at it. When the DM starts really getting into this, sometimes the the players can feel, uh, I don't know, uh, a little uh, little competition. I don't know. Certainly. In modern part, it's called an arms race a an little bit. An arms race, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which you'll lose um, if you're the I, w- player, you know. <laughs> I mean, technically, the DM has the entirety of the world to bring to bear. So right. how do you In a traditional this? RPG, sure. How do you, all right, yeah, how do you do it? Um I, for one, and uh, get a long time viewers are, are going to know that you talk to your players about it. You let them yeah. know, if not like in the middle of, of combat, but maybe, right? If it seems like this, that, that their, their bullshit meter is going off to such a degree that they're about ready to walk or that they're visibly upset about something, then you can say, hey, this is why I'm doing this. This is the justification for it. At the very least, that can be an opening towards what's going on. Is this working? Is this not? Um, But certainly after the fact, go, hey, you know, how was that fight? Was that too much, too little, frustrating, not engaging? You know, there's that. But also just letting them know straight up before you even get to that point, like, here's how I run my monsters. Here is how I run combat. Like I, I, I'm running it from my in-character perspective. Big, brutish, bestial monsters are going to try to eat you. If they drop one of you to zero, they will continue to attack you because they're trying to eat you, or they'll carry you off to yeah. do it. You know, is you know that might be a problem for some players. They don't expect that their character's going to be attacked after they drop to zero. And yet there's plenty of, of ways to approach combat where it's logical and reasonable for a monster to attack a character that's gone down. So like communicating like these zombies. things to your players, right? Like zombies, right? Or, or, or big beasts <laughs> or like people who are, who are like, yeah, they have a cleric in their group. You better kill these people. Not just like hope that they're dead when you move on. Um, yeah. But, but tell your players that that's how it's going to be. And if it's just for one fight, even just to like, hey, in this fight, it's going to, you know, they're going for, they're playing for keeps, they're going for the throat. Um, and then the, the flip side of that is to know your limits as a DM and not exceed them. And, uh, you know, we were talking earlier in the Patreon question, or maybe not yet, you haven't seen it, uh, <laughs> about rules is written, right, uh, of of groups who see the rules as a contract between player and DM so that they know what the limits are was it is and isn't acceptable Mm -hmm. and uh, aggressive or adversarial play is enjoyable within that framework right as long as these lines aren't crossed we're going to play as if we're antagonists you know and and I think that that that's I love that style of gaming actually I find it really fun um yeah, but I know that not a lot of players like that. So, when I'm the DM and I want to engage in something that I think might be considered adversarial, I make double sure that I'm playing within the limits. That I'll be extra careful to play rules as written, as well as communicate this to the players so that they know, like, hey, this one enemy, this is how they're approaching this. They are trying to kill you. They are trying to take you out. They're trying to separate you and capture you. And, you know, that's the opportunity for the players to say, I want none of this. <laughs> like, this is anti-fun, don't want a part of it. And we can uh, see how we can go from there. But better that before all of it gets started than in the middle of combat when one of them has just had enough 
and throws down mm-hmm. their dice and is like, this is BS. Why, <laughs> why, yeah. why did you kill my character like that? You know, why did my prisoner, why did they take me away? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I shouldn't have played the game on hard. Should have started on easy, on story, <laughs> mo- on story play. You know, I, I mean, sure, sure. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I think this applies to all level of play, though, right? Like, I, I get what you're saying about like the challenge and and how difficult a combat can be. But I think even if you're not in it for challenging combats, even if you're not here for like white knuckled tactical war gaming, you know, every fight has significant stakes kind of combat you can still say something about your world and and the the story that you're building together through how you portray your monsters through combat right there's all kinds of ways to do it outside of combat we've covered them in videos like npc videos our various monster shows uh we'll talk about mm-hmm. that as well but like it's this moment where for a lot of players especially for dnd uh you know that combat is this own its own separate thing initiative is rolled all the tokens and dice and and miniatures are out you know battle maps and everything it's it's very engaging very tactile but it can also feel separate from the other game that you're playing outside of that combat encounter and i think like making sure that you portray your monsters with fidelity to what's going on outside like helps to bridge that gap and helps to make the world Mm -hmm. seem real and for your for your characters or sorry for your players to feel like that they're playing a game that's more than a tactical war game. They're playing a, a role-playing game, a game where they can immerse themselves into it and the world's a living place that reacts to them. Yeah, that's that, that, that sounds amazing. But mom's well, yeah. just gotta eat something. <laughs> that's kind of it, yeah, well, that's kind of it, yeah. <laughs> And if you're hungry for more WebDM content, you can head on over to Patreon. We do a podcast every week. It's like an hour and a half. It just, just, it, it, it's a, it's a buffet in and of itself. Also, look up on your favorite podcast app for WebDM Talks for our podcast that we put up, uh, I believe, weekly. And uh, you know, be sure to like, subscribe, comment down below. Let us know. Uh, hit that bell. Make sure you get notifications for new shows.